We have a number of apologies this morning. Apologies from Linda Fabiani, Tavish Scott and Stuart Maxwell. Bill Kidd, though, will be substituting for Linda Fabiani. Um, I'd also like to very much warmly welcome Alison Johnson to the committee this morning um, and say at this stage a grateful thank you to Patrick Harvey for all of his contribution and valued interventions during the, the course of the referendum bill and the early part of the work we've been involved in, Patrick. Um, we're very grateful for that, and I know you're here as an observer today. Uh, I'd also like to say thank you while I'm in that vein to Annabel Ewing for her contribution to the committee during your time in the referendum bill committee and also at the beginning of the devolution further powers committee and of course now we have mark mcdonald who's joined us also as well so welcome to mark mcdonald and and to allison and that wasn't my phone that was going off there um i think that the, we've come to therefore the first item on the agenda which is item one um, regarding uh, new members and declarations of interest so in that way, can I invite, first of all, Alison to declare any relevant interests to the work of the committee? No, no interests to declare. Thank you very much, Alison. Can I do likewise with Mark MacDonald? No relevant interests to declare, convener. Well, well, thank you very much for that. Um, OK, that moves us on, in that case, swiftly to agenda item two, um, the Smith Commission and Evidence. And I will very much warmly welcome Lord Smith of Kelvin to the committee and thank him for agreeing to come to this committee first, I think, before any other committees. I know you have I know you've done lots of media opportunities since the <laughs> announcement last week, um, but since the publication of the report, this is the first committee appearance you've had anywhere. I'd also like to welcome Jenny Bates, who's the head of the Secretariat at the Commission, who's also here to assist Lord Smith in giving his evidence. But just before I invite Lord Smith to make any opening remarks um, to present his report to us, I'd like to remind the committee and, and recognise and state that his role is a, has been as a mediator and chair of the Smith Commission, and ultimately it was for the political parties to agree any deal that was done. I ask all present to remember that when it comes to questions. Furthermore, after Lord Smith's remarks, as this, um, I'm going to ask a very general question at the, the beginning of the process. I'll then turn to Lewis MacDonald to do the same. We'll then look at each major area to make sure we use our time properly, probably go tax, welfare, constitutional issues, so that we, we can keep everything together in that regard. And I'd ask members to stick to that structure, try not to jump ahead, but obviously catch my eye if you feel you need to. Our time's pretty limited with Lord Smith this morning. He's got other commitments, which is t totally understandable. So if we could keep our questions brief, and I'll try to do the same, then we can probably make more progress uh, uh, during the, the, the meeting. So with that being said, Lord Smith, I don't know if you wish to make any comments, and then we can open up to questions. I have got a, an opening statement yes, sure. for me. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for your invitation to join you today, and also for the opportunity to make this brief opening statement. Let me begin by thanking Parliament, uh, which has supported our work throughout. We benefited from the secondment of some excellent parliamentary staff to our Secretariat. The Parliament also hosted our talks on a number of occasions, most no notably our public session uh, where we heard from civic leaders. And I've personally valued the counsel of the presiding officer throughout this process. My first act upon appointment to the role was to visit the Parliament to listen to the debate and the referendum. So it's uh, fitting that uh, another visit is one of my last acts too. I wanted to take the opportunity of a short opening statement to make four very brief points. First, we achieved cross-party agreement. It was tough and intense at times, and I feared we might not get there, but we did, and all five people signed up, all five parties signed up. That in itself is important, and I pay tribute to the nominees for that. This agreement is their agreement. I just helped them get there. And secondly, we had a fortunate starting position. Almost all of the parties entered the talks having already undertaken their own analysis and discussion. They had already reached important conclusions on how the powers of the Parliament should be strengthened. And without that work, I have no doubt it would have been much more difficult, if not impossible, to reach a conclusion in the limited timescale we had. And thirdly, we had some great support. I was backed by an exceptional secretariat drawn from Scottish Government, Scottish Parliament and the UK Government. And the secretariat was supported by both governments who provided analysis and advice all the way through the process to ensure the agreement could be delivered and would work. 
and I'm pleased, as you say, to be joined today by Jenny Bates, who led the Secretariat throughout this process. Lastly, a few words about my role. My job was straightforward, to convene and to chair cross-party talks. I had no voice in the debate and have offered no view on the outcome. I entered the process politically unaligned and without a declared view on the constitutional debate, and I'd like to leave it that way. It's not for me to provide a commentary or an interpretation of the agreement or an analysis of, it, of its impact, and I don't believe it would be right for me to do so even today. The weight of this appointment has never been lost on me. It followed what I consider to be one of the most extraordinary political events of my lifetime, the referendum. I never for a moment expected the agreement to satisfy everyone. That would have been impossible. Some people strongly believe the agreement doesn't go far enough, and some believe it goes too far. And I respect and I understand both of those positions. My ob object was to chair a process which was well run, fair, and resulted in a package of new powers to strengthen the Parliament, and I believe we've achieved that. I'd be delighted to take questions now, Chair. Yeah, thank you very much for your opening statement, Lord Smith. I'm very grateful. Uh, many people have recognised that the late Donald Dewar, one of the cleverest decisions he made in negotiating the Scotland Act in 1998, was to tackle the issue of what powers would come to the Scottish Parliament by reversing um, the, the question and asking his then cabinet colleagues to justify um, what would be reserved. That's why the Act obviously has a list of reserved powers, not devolved. Um, if it's not listed, then it's not devolved. Uh, can I begin by asking Lord Smith, what was the nature of the approach followed by yourselves in the Commission? Um, did you start with the premise that unless a power could be justified, uh, justifiably reserved, it should be devolved? Or did you assume that all matters um, remain reserved unless all parties present at the Commission and the UK Government could agree they could be devolved? Uh, because arguably, I would suggest the latter approach will always potentially result in fewer powers for Scotland. So your approach on that would be understanding it would be very useful. Almost a, a hybrid of those. Uh, what I did was, I, I mentioned I came to Parliament, I met the leaders of all the parties, and I asked them to nominate two people from each of their parties, who probably one of whom ought to be an MSP, because I wanted to reach deep into the parties rather than have gurus, if you like, and it, we agree with them and have to go back and get political backing. And then I said, within two weeks, I want you to give me your position on what powers you think should be devolved. I didn't say maximise, I didn't say what should be reserved, I said powers that should be devolved. And within two weeks, all parties, because there were things like Strathclyde and Ming Campbell and various other papers that had been produced by parties, and all five parties produced what they thought uh, they could, uh, or thought, in their opinion, it was right to devolve. Uh, so when we got to our first plenary meeting, we all knew what the various positions were around the table. And from there, I just tried to get some sort of common ground between the parties. That's how I went about it. Okay. Um, just to so dig a bit further on that particular issue, was the working principle behind the overall package that the, the UK pooling and sharing model, as described by the Westminster Party leaders in their statement around the, the vow, should be, would it be retained in areas such as welfare and social security, or was it the principle that we should maximise autonomy, just in terms of the, again, in terms of the process and how it was set out? I think I've referred to you, we, the, the very first meeting we agreed, uh, well, subsequently we agreed that we had agreed at that first meeting, uh, seven principles, and it, you'll see from the seven principles that it was a substantial and cohesive package of powers uh, enabling delivery of outcomes meaningful to people of Scotland, strengthen the devolution settlement and the Scottish Parliament within the UK, uh, including Parliament's level of financial account levels of financial accountability, a durable but responsive democratic settlement will maintain Scotland place in the UK, not be conditional, and that may come up later on in questioning, on the conclusion of other political negotiations elsewhere in the UK, mm -hmm. not cause detriment as the, the movement of powers happened, not to cause detriment one way or the other, uh, and not to cause UK government or Scottish government to gain or lose financially simply because we're devolving power, and to be implementable. That, th those were the principles, and that's what we worked against. OK, well, thank you very much. That's very helpful in understanding that at the beginning. Louis MacDonald. Thank you very much, and good morning. 
I read very carefully the uh, forward on the other comments you've made regarding the work of the Commission, and there's clearly a number of imperatives operating on you, and I'd be interested in your comments on them, particularly the requirement on the one hand to achieve a consensus, to achieve agreement among parties. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, the objective clearly of defining a coherent set of proposals, and also, finally, uh, the work you, you, you did and initiated yourself to make sure that uh, other voices were heard uh, in the work of the committee. How did you balance those imperatives and, and uh, how did you uh, choose uh, which weight, uh, how you would uh, ensure that they were all reflected in the work of the Commission? See, and this will be a theme that comes across each time. I wasn't choosing anything, right? There were 10 people around the table. Sure. They were making the decisions at the end of the day. And I was just bringing what skills I have as a chairman to just to try and make sure that, that people met somewhere. And I don't mean the lowest common denominator. I mean powers that people could get around and agree that they were useful for, for Scotland. Uh, and into that mix, as well as the, the, initial, the initial submissions that we got from the five parties, uh, we encouraged people, the public, to write in. We got more than 18,000 emails. And even if you take out some of the slightly scurrilous ones, uh, you, there, were a, there was a lot of information in there uh, that the politicians actually had to, to take into consideration. I also wrote out, I think it was 129 civic organisations, and that's everything from trade unions to third sector, people, volunteer, voluntary sector and so on, and to business organisations and, and other interested people. And 407 of them replied. Right? There are more civic organisations out there than even I had realised. And the submissions that came in from these people uh, were of very, very high quality. Within days of receiving these, we had them up on our website, so it was a transparent process, and we shared them immediately with all the five parties. So we were informed hugely by what we'd learned. And you probably know I went walkabout in Scotland. I went from the borders, which was easy for me, uh, around Scotland, as Aberdeen and Inverness and Dundee and Stirling and Glasgow and so on. And I met quite a number of people. Now, they were not getting preferential treatment, but what I wanted was simply to hear uh, the word in the street, the mood music, to add to the submissions that were coming in. It was the submissions we based it on, and that helped inform our discussion around the table to supplement the, the five submissions that had come in from the political parties. Yeah, I, I fully recognise that the coherence of the proposals is not ultimately your responsibility, but what I was interested in particular was the efforts you did make, you, uh, as you say, travelled the country, encouraged submissions, went out and sought submissions. So the, the, to, to understand the means by which you ensured that the responses that you got to all of that were, were, were not just fed in, but were uh, uh, reflected in the discussions among the parties. Well, I, we actually had two meetings, a meeting uh, split into two here in Holyrood as well, where we had a number of civic uh, society people came in and, and uh, the, the five parties could actually address them and say, look, I don't understand what you're saying here. Explain it uh, more carefully to me. But we weaved in, we made sure that we looked at all the themes that came out of the, the uh, emails and all the themes that came out of the civic society, and we talked about them openly around the, the, the table. That's very helpful. You, you, you said in concluding the report that, you, that it had required some parties to move further along the devolution route than perhaps they'd wanted, and it meant for others accepting an outcome that fell sh short of their ultimate ambitions. Do you feel, since you stood up on Thursday morning, that, that parties have accepted the outcome of the Commission and supported them in that spirit in which you presented the report? I, I think they accepted it. I, I've obviously read what's been said by people uh, since then, and I respect the position. Uh, taking one particular thing, if you believe in independence, uh, you know, you're, you're going to say you still believe in independence. That doesn't change people's political convictions and if they want full independence and they want all powers, I absolutely understand that. But for the purposes of this particular commission, which I'd now like to be called an agreement, by the way, commissions tend to last a couple of years and take evidence from people and so on. This was uh, 10 weeks, but we did get agreement and all five parties were happy that I stood up and said, 
that we had arrived at an agreement among all parties. And that's unprecedented. That hasn't been done before. Kalman didn't work that way. The original settlement didn't work that way. All five parties signed up to this. But of course they have their own political convictions outside. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. I think Mark McDonald, the signal you'd like to general question. Yeah, I think it might help seeg into the into the taxation element through a convener. And I just wanted to pick up on your, your seven the seven principles, well not your seven principles, Lord Smith, beg your pardon, the Commission's seven principles, particularly five and six. Not cause detriment to the UK as a whole nor any of its constituent parts, cause neither the UK government nor the Scottish government to gain or lose financially simply as a consequence of devolving a specific power. Now obviously the the question of detriment could be said to be subjective in some ways. Um, we've seen, for example, the recent response from uh, the Labour Party at uh, UK level regarding APD with their letter to the Chancellor of the Exchequer implying there could be detriment as a result of that power. So what analysis was, was applied to those principles from outside of the Commission uh, or the members of the Commission in order to inform the conclusions that were arrived at? Well, we did. I might ask Jenny to come in in a second, but we, every time we spoke about uh, uh, devolving a particular power, we did quite a bit of research. We asked the UK government and the Scottish government in particular to provide research to us. I, I well remember uh, on one occasion 330 pages of analysis coming from the UK government. Not to be outdone, the Scottish government sent a bigger document with a slightly different analysis, by the way, uh, all uh, based on empirical evidence, of course, but with a slightly different conclusion. Uh, and, and incidentally, can I just say this, that uh, this evidence was coming from the UK and the Scottish governments, and of course members of the UK and the Scottish governments were getting this information directly. We actually went to the UK government and the Scottish government and said, the Labour Party and the Green Party are being disadvantaged in this. May they have copies of all this? And both agreed. So all this information was given to all the parties around the table. Uh, so when we looked at, you know, what is detriment, and of course the subjectivity in the thing, we, we look carefully to see whether there would be detriment and whether there would be uh, a UK or Scottish government gaining or losing financially as, as, a, as a result. Jenny, do you want to... Uh, yeah, I mean, what I would just add to that is that we looked, so based on the fact that the parties had all put proposals into the Commission, we made sure that the analysis and the evidence that came from both governments covered every single proposal that had been put to the Commission, so that we had information looking at every proposal for a devolved power. Um, I would add also that obviously some of the material that we received from the civic organisations had evidence attached to it. So some people sent us evidence and analysis as well as views about which powers they thought were devolved. And that was obviously factored into the discussions so that we could make sure that every decision that the parties were looking at was based on some understanding of the impacts of operating powers. Um, so did any recommendations come out before the final report on the basis of those principles or the basis of input? Yes, is a short answer. Um, I, I don't want to go into, you know, I've been reading blow by blow accounts and the Glasgow Herald and the Scotsman and so on about exactly what happened inside. Uh, so I don't want to go into that. But yes, there were some proposals that we felt could have caused detriment, some proposals that looked as if they might be unworkable. So we had to look at the practicalities and, and the implement, implementability of a lot of these things and obviously some things we felt we couldn't go forward with. And was that quite late on in the process? I mean, were we, I mean the, 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 the media reports have spoken about there being a draft, draft conclusions which were then revised following input from outside we, of the We had nine plenary meetings, there were nine drafts. So, uh, uh, you know, th things were changing all the time. And by the way, these hands that were shredding the thing in the Herald are not my hands. <laughs> Mine are quite stubby, and they were very elegant, long fingers. I was quite impressed. Rob, did you... I would. Rob Good morning, Lord Smith. Uh, you said in one of your four items that uh, you got support and analysis and advice from the Scottish and UK governments. Um, you said that the parties agreed, the five parties made the agreement, ultimately. Uh, but, you know, the advice from 
the Scottish and UK governments must have weighed heavily in some instances. How did the views of the parties weigh against the advice of governments, particularly in the final uh, draft of the report? Do you know, I, I was, first of all, kind of pay tribute to the quality of the people who were sitting around the table. Uh, I, 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 you, you might smile, but I, I genuinely mean that. And I've got a long career in private and public sector. The 10 people sitting around that table were high quality people. And actually, I believe that they were taking their own position on a lot of things. I'm quite sure they were being fed advice uh, from, you know, can I call them superiors in the party, uh, in the various parties? But they were listening to arguments and they were actually taking part in a discussion in arriving at conclusions. And I believe, you know, very much from their own, uh, their own thoughts, uh, as much as being informed by uh, Scottish government or by a uh, UK government or by uh, anyone else who was out there. So... I think it was. I was. I thought they were amazingly robust in the, the in the discussions. I'll leave it at there. Whether you do senior or superior, I guess both would have got you into trouble. Anyway. I don't. So, I... Um, <laughs> before I move, I, I'm new to politics, generally, <laughs> uh, and by the way, I'm going to remain new to politics. <laughs> Before I move on to areas of taxation issues, I think Drew... Yeah, to... uh, briefly, it was just two points. So I'll just ask them yeah. together for time, Bruce, yeah. if, th if that's OK. But just picking up, uh, Lord Smith, welcome to the committee. Good morning. Um, the, uh, you, you mentioned some of the reports that we've seen in the media since um, the publication of the report. And obviously, you were very clear um, while the Commission was sitting that you wanted that degree of confidentiality and you thought that was important to the process. Um, I suppose once these things start, it becomes inevitable that if one version of events go out, then a, a, a differing view will be put. Um, publicly, do you have any view about whether uh, about that happening now that, that you want to express? And, and, and I suppose the second um, point that uh, I wanted to um, get your view on, Lord Smith, is uh, to what extent the, the pressure of time, um, which, which hung over this whole process, actually helped you drive towards um, consensus? Um, and if that time pressure hadn't been there, you might not have been able to achieve as much as you had, or whether it, it was a difficulty throughout? Okay. Um just taking the, the first one first, I mean, I, I, well, let, I don't know which one to go for here. Uh, the first question was? Uh, regarding this issue around the, the confidentiality People of talking the, after yes, the event. Of how the Look, I, I think I've already uh, alluded to that. I, I absolutely respect people's uh, political opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to speak to their people outside. Um, what I do know is that the, the negotiations that I was party to and I, I chaired uh, were conducted in a good spirit. It got heated from time to time, but humour was there as well. And all five parties agreed that what we wrote down there, line by line, they all bought into. Now, I'm quite sure people have political ambitions beyond that. Uh, and there may be people who felt, you know, in, in parties that they had gone too far. Uh, but th that's what we agreed at the time, and I have not heard any of the parties turn around and say they thought the process was wrong. They all say it was well conducted, and you know I believe they all stand by the, the outcomes. So I'm not you know particularly disappointed in anything that's been said, uh, and I, th I respect the right to say it. Um, on the timing, I think it actually worked in our favour. What we have to remember is that, you know, had I been given two years to do this, uh, by the way, I wouldn't have taken the job if it had been two years, but mm -hmm. if we had two years to do this, we would have all sorts of additional analysis and so on. These subjects have been talked about in great detail. We've, the Ming Campbell report, the Strathclyde report, the, uh, the 2012 Act, uh, lots and lots of Pete Christie and various others, lots of things have been written about, about this. And the parties were able to come up with very reasoned uh, arguments within two weeks because the material was there. And I, I'm always a feeling that if, if you allow people another three months, they'll take another three months. Did we manage to do enough analysis in this? Let me tell you, there was a cottage industry in the civil service, both south of the border and up here, with people producing uh, information. If we needed to know about a particular tax or about a particular welfare provision, we got experts 
in DWP or in uh, Treasury or whatever to produce, or in Scottish Government, to produce information for us very quickly. With this, this, is, this stuff is implementable. I know it is. We've argued it through. A lot, some of the details not there in some cases, but we know that it's implementable because we did sufficient research. So those who say we didn't have enough time, I reject that. We did have enough time, and we've arrived at a conclusion. Those who said, you'll never get five parties to agree, we did get five parties to agree, whatever is being said outside now. So I'm relaxed about the process. Thank you. I think we'll move into the sort of broader area, uh, sorry, more generally of taxation now. And Alison Johnson, do you want to kick that off? Yeah, um, thank you. Good morning. I'd just like to explore the rationale um, for where the boundary was drawn between taxis devolved and taxis reserved in, in a couple of specific cases. How did the Commission agree that the first 10% of VAT receipts should go to the Scottish Government's budget? We were looking at uh, assignment because you cannot devolve VAT. VAT is controlled by EU and it, it can't be split. You, you can't have a VAT rate in Scotland relative to uh, the rest of the UK. So that rate is going to be set somewhere. And then we decided, well, how much of this could be assigned? And there were discussions about whether it could be 15 points, right? 15% is a rate, because that's the minimum rate in, in Europe. Uh, and we discussed it, and there were arguments about volatility of tax receipts. Uh, there were arguments about how far you should go in these things. I, it, the, the problem is if you're raising a lot of money in one particular area, and we're talking here about something like £9 billion in, in uh, VAT receipts in Scotland, uh, where should you actually draw the line? And eventually we came out at a figure of 50% of the rate but note it's not 50% of the receipts, it's 50% of the rate, and that was fixed at 10. So if Scotland prospers as a country, then that 10% will grow, the receipts will grow. If something happens to Scot the Scot Scotland's economy, that'll go down. So the, but if there is, say, for example, uh, w m more cutting by the UK government, uh, that should not direct the effect, because the 10% on, of the VAT will come out of block grant. That's now standing alone. So here is something that's riding on the Scottish economy. With power comes responsibility. So that part of the thing is now, in, you know, that is funding a big chunk of the, the welfare spending and, and other spending that Scotland has. So why 10% and not 9% or 15%? I wish you'd been inside the room to take part in this, the discussion. But that's where we came out. Patrick's looking embarrassed now, and, <laughs> and rightly so. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. Um, if we look at corporation tax, which... Uh, sorry. A bit of clarity on that, that issue, just before you go into corporation tax, because just so I understand this, obviously under, I, I get the package on VAT, and if it's an assigned revenue, is it the case then, though, as assigned revenues I understand in the past has been, that if it's an assigned revenue, there's also a reduction in the block grant to the same level? And if so, would there actually be a net benefit? I just need a bit of clarity around that because I'm not sure. time of transfer, there should be no benefit and no loss. Right. So, but it is a direct deduction from the block grant. So Treasury right. expert here, but it, it is. If that... If, if that money at the time of, of being yeah. passed over, there is no plus or minus. Yeah. Straight off the block grant, and now it's raised against the economy, if you like, as 10 points on, on okay. VAT. So, so after the first year and, and the first implementation, there'll be, no, there'll be no yearly adjustment after that then? So the way to think about it is that you're switching something that's funded by the block grant for something that's now yeah, so no dependent on what happens to VAT revenues. So in the past, the change over time would be a function of what was happening to the block grant. In the future, under this world, the change to revenues is going to be a function of what's happening to VAT revenues. So they would normally grow over time a little bit based on the growth 
uh, inflation in the economy. So the, no the nominal figure usually goes up. But the point that Lord Smith is making is that um, variability in that income is going to be a function of what happens in the economy. If consumption goes up, you get more VAT revenues. If consumption goes down, you get less VAT revenues. Yeah, but, but, but go back to that main question I just asked there, that will the block grant be adjusted? If the VAT incre income increases, will the block grant be reduced on a, to, to reflect that on, in the annual settlement? If 10% if, if of the vat -able activity mm -hmm. goes up, yep. Scottish Government keeps that. Okay. So, so it's rise and fall on economic activity. Yes. More VAT paid, 10 points of that, the Scottish Government will keep. Okay, and then there's no adjustment so there's no for the grant. Okay, well, that's, year by that's year useful adjustment. to get that clarified, because that's, that's different to how the assigned process would normally work, so that's very helpful. Alison, sorry to interrupt you there. I just want Corporation to tax, I think, yeah. yeah. Is it I on that specific point? Sorry, Alison, on that area. Right. Sure. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Yeah, just uh, on that particular point, um, now this it may well be a hypothetical question, but um, was uh, in terms of the process, now, did you look ahead to any potential policy changes? Now, I'm not suggesting any particular ones, but if a, if a, if a government decided to have a uh, to change the, the VAT rate or to change. Um, how VAT would actually be uh, implemented or maybe re remove VAT from a particular area uh, further down the line, um, how that effect would then, or how that would actually affect Scotland and the revenues that Scotland could potentially have. Um, <clears throat> so obviously this is about the devolution of a power rather than how the power is operated, and that was a sort of common principle across the work of the Commission. Um, so we looked at whether a power should be devolved rather than the policy choices that might happen once that power is devolved. So that was kind of the general way that we went about it. Um, as Lord Smith has said, though, that the way that the VAT assignment would work, if there's a change in the rate from 20p, um, given that Scotland would take the first 10p and the rest would go to the UK, a change in the rate at the UK level doesn't directly affect the amount of revenue that, that Scotland would receive as we've said, what does affect the revenue that Scotland would receive is the nature of the economy in Scotland, whether that was growing faster or slower. But I think there's also a technical question on supposing someone decides that children's shoes or whatever it happens mm. to be it, it no longer attracts VAT or will attract VAT or something. You know, and yeah. it's that sort of... Um, so there's sort of two points to make in relation to that. The first is that, as you'll be aware, VAT is a European-wide tax and decisions about VAT are made at European level. Um, so changes to VAT are something that would need to be decided at, at EU level. As a result of that, um, uh, that, that's the way that the policy would be made. The second point to make, I guess, is that um, was if there was a change to the base in terms of the... the, the things that are taxed or not taxed in either direction, that would affect the revenue that's, that, that's received. But has there been a mechanism built in, um, go, looking ahead, in terms of if there were to be um, VAT removed from a particular item, um, in terms of the, the, the consultation um, that, the, that, that Scotland, the Scottish Government, uh, at the time, uh, would, uh, could actually have with the UK Government at that particular time? Yeah about the detail of how the governments operate the system in future. And, and, and also, Chair, um, you, we've said very strongly in here that consultation between governments has mm -hmm. to be improved. Mm -hmm. I, I say right. that in, in the That's four items that I personally raise, but we've also got things in here about the Scottish voice has to be listened to, so I, I'm certain that will be picked up. OK, Listen, thank you. Uh, Alison, I'm sorry. That sorry, corporation tax. <laughs> corporation tax, yeah. Yeah, um, I'd just like to understand how agreement was reached to devolve APD um, while a decision was made to reserve corporation tax when you could apply similar arguments to the impact that both might have in a way. You know, um, if, if APD is devolved, we might see a race to the bottom. Um, you know, and the same argument has been used time and time again in discussion about the corporation tax. So I'd just like to better understand okay. how those decisions were right. reached. Overwhelmingly, if you look at the, the evidence, this is where the, the uh, input from Civic Scotland and others uh, is very important. Um, APD, there was overwhelming uh, demand for something to be done about APD. 
and it came in several different areas. Um, <clears throat> one is businesses saying moving from a hub down to London, for example, to go and do business makes business life in Scotland very, very expensive and we're disadvantaged and could something be done about that? Could we have the power to at least think about that? Tourism, a huge voice from tourism saying we are being disadvantaged, here is an opportunity. I can tell you, and I'm not uh, speaking out of school, but I would imagine uh, the Greens may well take the view it's let's have control over APD because actually we're concerned about uh, CO2 emissions and so on. So you get, what happens to powers when they're devolved is entirely a matter for the politicians who are going to exercise those powers. But a lot of people wanted the power over APD, and I didn't hear very many arguments against APD coming. Different for corporation tax. Uh, now, corporation tax, an interesting lever, but uh, Civic Scotland, and I mean the uh, STUC, the employers' organisations like CBI and others, uh, and even the an institute that cannot be attacked in its objectivity, the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland, of which I'm a member, a number of these organisations, a large number of these organisations were saying, do not tinker with corporation tax. It will lead to strange behaviours, and in the end, you'll regret you know, what you're doing. And that was coming from the trade union side, it was coming from employers, it was coming from disinterested observers who understand tax. So there's a, a very, very strong view out there, never mind what the politicians were saying around the table, do not uh, interfere there. And can I just uh, add something else on that? There's been talk about uh, possible uh, devolution of corporation tax to Northern Ireland. We were aware of rumours around that there might be corporation tax going to Northern Ireland. Uh, this is where a chair steps into his own in these things. And I said, we are here, remember what we said, about uh, <coughs> not conditional on, on the conclusion of political ne negotiations elsewhere in the UK. What is right for Scotland? If it's right for us to devolve corporation tax, let's talk about that and how it would happen and so on. If it's not right, then never mind that someone over here is getting a bag of sweeties. We ought to have that bag of sweeties. Why do we want this bag of sweeties? Why? And we talked about it at great length and eventually decided that it's not something that would be in the interests of Scotland to have as a power. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Just for a record, we're HMT or the Chancellor's Office asked their view about it at, as you began to discuss the Northern Ireland situation. We, we asked views uh, of Scottish Government, UK Government, Treasury, Biz, uh, you know, off-gem off and, and deck and so on. We, we spoke all over the place to people about what was possible and, and you know, what their views were. But the views that we signed up to were our views. And specifically on corporation tax as well, Lord Absolutely. Okay. That, that decision was made inside the room. OK. Now, I've got three other people who have indicated they want to contribute on the tax term. I'm just watching the time here, though, so we need to rattle on a bit. Bill Kidd, please. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for all the work that yourself and your commission have carried out, uh, Lord Kelvin. Um, in terms of uh, the increased borrowing powers which are being suggested, um, can I ask, because <clears throat> I'm not an expert on this at all, and it might be Ms Bates, might be the right person to ask, um, in terms of that, uh, the fiscal baseline that will be envisioned um, will include, no doubt, the Barnett formula as well as variations that might take place in taxation uh, under the Scottish Parliament. Um, would that leave um, the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government in, in enacting these powers in a position of relative advantage or disadvantage? I know you're saying that there shouldn't be any advantage or disadvantage, um, but uh, with the Barnett formula still being there to a degree or to an element that's still got to be agreed, um, how is it? And how would you see um, the borrowing powers being used in terms of uh, supporting capital infrastructure projects? Please. Um, so what the report says is that um, the recommendation is that borrowing powers should be uh, increased and substantial and agreed with the UK government. So the detail of the borrowing powers is something that will be sorted out as part of the implementation of the Smith Commission. Um, and 
to be honest, kind of what happens to those borrowing powers is ultimately a decision for a future Scottish Parliament in how it wants to exercise the use of those powers. So it's a bit difficult to say sitting here what the effect of that would be. It's ultimately a decision for, for the future Parliament how it wanted to exercise and use additional borrowing powers. Um, you're right on the Barnet formula. The report is very clear that the Barnet formula will continue to be in operation for the block grant and there will continue to be some block grant funding under the impact of these proposals. The block grant would still continue to operate and the Barnet formula would continue to be the, the mechanism that determined the block grant. Okay. Thank you. Um, Lewis MacDonald, please. Just simply to follow that up, uh, did you take evidence as a commission on how the Barnet formula would be updated, update, uh, updated in view of the changes included in the agreement, uh, and, and if so, is that evidence relevant to the work that will clearly have to be done in the next few months by governments in, in making that happen? So I think there was a fairly strong consensus around the table that the Barnet formula would remain, and that is what the Commission has agreed. So um, it wasn't something that we looked at in a lot of detail how you would change or amend it. We've just said that it's some, the Commission just said it's something that should continue to operate. Rob Gibson. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Lord Smith, the, the National Union of Students in Scotland has welcomed the proposed powers for the Scottish Government to set rates and thresholds for income tax raised from non-dividend and non-savings incomes, as I do. However, we're concerned at the exclusion of non-dividend and non-savings incomes from the reach of these new powers will mean that the Scottish Parliament is unable to exercise its own tax policy as they say, where it matters most. I'm just interested to know how you uh, came up with that sort of formula. If I understand the question, can we just go back to the, the powers that uh, the Scottish Government has at the moment, or will have uh, after uh, the 2012 Act comes in? And it does take about three years for these things to bite, yep. as we, you'll have gathered. Uh, so... <laughs> Even with the 2012 Act coming in, the Scottish Government with the ability to vary tax rates 10%, there are three levels of tax, 20%, 40%, 45%. They will be able to vary those, but in lockstep. So if you want to increase your 45% to, say, 50 your 40 has to go up to 45 your 20 has to go up to 25 If you want to take 5 off, your 20 goes down to 15, your 40 to 35, your, your 45 has to come down to 40. Our proposal here, or our agreement, as I like to keep uh, calling it, because it's much more powerful than I expect the people around this table to ensure this agreement finally finds its way into the statute book, um, it, it is not in lockstep. Uh, you can raise taxes, you can increase rates, bans, reduce rates, bans. You could raise this rate, reduce that rate, keep that one where it is. So I think there's a huge amount, huge amount of power and leverage in there. And by the way, it amounts to 6.8 billion of income. Uh, now, you know, the responsibility of how you go about that and so on now re will now rest with the, the Scottish Parliament. But I think that gives a huge income. I think what we were concerned about was when, when you start interfering with uh, savings, with dividend income and with interest income, uh, and you know there's a huge industry in Scotland and a lot of people's pensions are dependent on this, if you start to create differences across borders in those areas, uh, just as in pensions and so on, you, you, you're taking a very, very big step and it could lead to a lot of confusion. Well, Following that up, there's experience when uh, there was a 50 pence tax rate under the last Labour administration uh, where the highest earners were often able to avoid tax by receiving bonuses or other non-dividend income. Uh, that means that uh, the potential under income tax is restricted considerably in order well, to be able to, uh, to, to raise that money, whether I, it's uh, you know, down no, south I, or I think we're talking anti-avoidance here, and I am absolutely for anti-avoidance. I think the UK government certainly speaks very strongly about that, and I think a Scottish government ought to be the same. Uh, I, I have you know, no truck with people who avoid paying income tax. And incidentally, since I'm much older than most of the people around this room, I can tell you I, at one point people in the UK when I was a young lad 
were paying income tax at 83% sure. and at 98% on charmingly called unearned income, that's savings and dividends and so on. So we, we've been in different regimes. I'm not suggesting that uh, these rates are things that should apply in Scotland, but I'm just saying it has happened in the past. Well, we'll need to move on. I'm watching the clock here. I think we need to move into the welfare area. I just talk too much. Right? <laughs> Well, I wouldn't have let you filibuster anyway. So <laughs> uh, right, welfare area. Mark McDonald, I think you had indicated earlier you'd like to yeah, raise something on that. A, a couple of questions on this, if I may, convener. I'll, I'll make them brief. Um, I, I note that you, you've mentioned a number of times now the, the input from Civic Scotland. In relation to welfare, there was an overwhelming, uh, almost universal call for full welfare devolved to Scotland from, from civic society, charities, etc. What, what was the bulwark against that that led to the conclusions in the Commission's report? I think uh, there's a system called universal credit, which, as you know, is a major new reform in the welfare system. Uh, and the parties agreed that around that, uh, quite difficult to break that asunder, to around that that Scotland could have some flexibilities, and that would be particularly around things like the housing element, because you know that a lot of housing is already devolved, so it made a lot of sense and complementarity uh, for the Scottish Government to have the housing element of universal credit. Quite, quite different issues about housing in Scotland from elsewhere in the UK. Uh, to increase or reduce housing payment, flexibility around timing and so on, but actually to attack universal credit, it was felt it was not somewhere that we could actually go. And that was in arriving at, you know, at some sort of a consensus around the room. Uh, but outside universal credit, uh, there are something like two and a half billion of extra cost benefits being fully devolved. Uh, things like uh, disability living allowance, uh, winter fuel payments, there's a whole list of them in, in our report here. That's two and a half billion. The current uh, amount of benefits that's under the control of the Scottish Government is 400 million. So this is an extra two and a half billion is quite a, a, an increase in that area. Okay. Um, just to go back to the, the discussion we were having earlier, the, the reporting of which we've, we've discussed has suggested that universal credit was in a draft report and was dropped quite late in the process. Is that a fair reflection of what happened? I'm not happened? prepared to go into what... The, the final report is a final report. I'm okay. not prepared to go into blow by oh, blow oh, and who okay. said what to whom. OK, that, that's fine. Um, the, you've, you've mentioned, and, and the, the report has mentioned, about the flexibility for Scotland to create new benefits. And that, obviously, is a responsibility that would have to be funded accordingly. Um, the... The question around coherence is, as we just had with the taxation discussion, that without a, a panoply of tax options in order to create the funding to, to derive those new benefits, they'd have, either have to be funded through reductions elsewhere or dropping of other benefits or use of income tax as the only instrument. Did the coherence element play any role in, in terms of discussions around having new benefits created, but not necessarily having that broad tax power base to be able to fund new benefits that were created? Well, the, the, the block grant is, is used in different ways as well. So, you, you know, that, that would not be... Uh, but that's, that's available. In fact, about half of the funding of devolved powers would still be in the block grant and about half of it in directly raised uh, funds, including the VAT assignment. Right, so you've got 6.8 billion, an existing 4 billion or so, and about 4.5 billion for VAT adds up to about 15 billion out of the 30 billion or so, very roughly speaking, of, of spend. So uh, I think then it's up to government to make choices. Okay. It's just, you know, there, there's a finite amount of... What, one, one last very brief one. The D, DLA, or PIP, as it is going to become, has be, is, is, is mooted for devolving to, to Scotland. Um, obviously, at present, the, there are proposals for reductions in that budget and changes to the criteria through which people can, apply for pay, can, can qualify for payments. Was that factored into the discussions when looking at future projections, when looking at devolving that power? Um, the, the sort of the general principle here is that um, the 
the commission was looking at which powers to devolve and making a discussion based on the powers that were around and available now. And so that's the way that the discussions were approached. The precise details of how this will be done is something for the two governments to look at in due course as they do the implementation. You're right that many of these policy areas are policy areas that continue to evolve and move as we, as we are speaking and as this process of implementation takes hold, that will be the case. That's where governments have to talk. And we make this point very, very strongly that the Scottish voice needs to be heard. Consumer Millen. Uh, thank you. Just uh, quickly on, as you can, please. Sure, on this uh, particular point, certainly principle five and principle six regarding not cause detriment and also uh, the cause neither UK or Scottish governments to gain or lose um, financially. Um, reading uh, with that as a, as a, as a baseline, um, the whole issue of the, the welfare uh, and particularly paragraph 54 uh, of, the, uh, of the document, uh, and the issue of the creating of uh, new powers. Um, what, really, what really was the, the, the rationale uh, behind that particular area? Because uh, any particular uh, government uh, of the Scottish Parliament, if they did want to utilise these and create some new uh, benefits, um, surely that the, there would be a, a financial cost implication to them. Yes, there would. If, if the Scottish Government wants to, to bring in additional uh, benefits, they would have to find some way of paying for that. Mm -hmm. That's almost exactly the answer to the, yeah. to the earlier question. Uh, yeah, but uh, but that, there could be an argument, uh, with that being the case, that uh, that the Scottish Government uh, could therefore be considered to be, uh, at a, uh, be, be put a, at a, a negative position, uh, at a disadvantage, as compared to the situation. If they've decided to pay additional benefits, that's got to be funded. Mm. Uh, it's, it's not a case of saying, we want to pay additional benefits, can we have the money to do that? That has right. to be found. Right. Okay. 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 One, yeah. one point of clarity, just on, on universal credit, before we move on to the constitutional sort of area. Um, and I know you can't go into the detail of what party said what, etc., and I'm not expecting you to do that. But just on universal credit, was it considered to be technically impossible or was it politically difficult, the decision not to d devolve it? <laughs> What's the right answer to that? <laughs> A general useful discussion was had and the consensus was arrived at. Well, not good enough answer. Okay. I think that's a pretty reasonable question, just because I've not asked for specific detail. So. I mean, I think the answer is we looked at both the technical implementation and, and the, the, the choice about whether you would want to devolve the full amount of universal credit or not. And both of those were factors that played into the discussion. So it's, it was a conversation, as with many, around what, what is the right view about what should happen um, in terms of how much power should be devolved. So, the could, so it could, but it was the should that was the issue then. So it could be done, but the should was the issue. I mean, what I can say is that both, both of those issues were looked at in terms of the discussion around universal credit. Okay. Yes. But, but there was agreement that the coherent thing was to keep it together with the flexibilities around housing and timing that you described. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Constitutional stuff. And Drew wanted in on that issue, didn't you? Um, yeah, uh, thanks very much. Um, Convener Lodsmith, you mentioned a number of times there you know, the, the issues of the two governments working together, and I suppose this is a, a kind of hardy perennial of the whole discussion around Scotland's constitutions of how we create partnership arrangements. I, I just, you know, it's something you particularly highlighted in, in your report. I wondered if there was anything you wanted to share with the, the, the committee on putting the record as to what it is that you think needs to change. What can, can I just preface that by saying um, th there are huge new, a, a huge amount of authority, if, if this all is enacted, coming to Scottish Parliament. They can decide the number of MSPs. The Parliament will be made permanent within UK law. 16, 17-year-old voting, if they decide, uh, if the Parliament decides to go for that, even boundary changes, all sorts of things are available. So there's there's an amazing uh, embodiment of power, if you like, coming to, to the thing. The, the question, sorry, they, I, I just want... Well, I mean, the, there's been discussion around how the joint ministerial committees work in the past. Yep, there's been some right. discussion about how the parliament's come this, to I just wonder if you had any... It was very obvious uh, to me, and I think to, to other members as they listened to Civic Scotland, that the 
it's not just perennial comments about on fisheries policy were not really listened to or an agricultural policy, both of which are very, very important to the Scottish economy, were not really listened to. The, 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 the process of devolution has led to government saying, well, that's devolved, we don't really need to talk. And, and that's just wrong. Uh, and also, uh, where common causes may be made, whether it's in Europe or somewhere else, it could be an energy policy. So when energy policy is being thought about, fuel poverty or, or uh, energy efficiency or something, hey, is Scotland a wee bit different in this area? So instead of having one size fits all, let's listen to the Scottish voice. Uh, so, and you could, you'll know some of the areas I'm talking about. There's a different kind of fuel poverty mm -hmm. in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying to institutions like Ofgem or... Uh, DEC or you don't mind for your shorthand, you know what I'm talking about, Department of Energy and Climate Change and so on, uh, or indeed European matters or other matters, that the two governments, there ought to be mutual respect, they ought to listen to, to each other and actually communicate. So it's, it's across a whole range of areas. Most of you, you're always hearing about hey, our fisheries thing, you know, we weren't really represented and so on. And we're talking about setting up, not just saying, got to try harder, but actually have a memorandum of understanding so that the voices are heard. In a case of Ofcom or Ofgem, you have to consult with, the Scottish, with Scottish people before you bring in new policies on whatever it might be, energy areas or, or broadcast areas or whatever. So that's all we're saying is it's... It's kind of broke, and it's not working perfectly, and it's getting in the way of, and I'm, I'm talking about civil servants as well, mm -hmm. but if you fix it at, at, uh, at a ministerial level and, and fix it quite formally at ministerial level, then you have an opportunity for that to cascade down. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, think that, that, I think that's a helpful contribution to, to the debate around that, but just uh, I'd like to hear more of what you've got to say about it. But to move on, I wondered if I could ask you... Um, uh, uh, around uh, another issue which, which you raised yourself, which is around the public's understanding of the constitutional uh, framework in Scotland. And do you, to what extent do you see the success of this, of, of your agreement, of, of our agreement, um, uh, being dependent upon, uh, in terms of the stability of that agreement, being dependent upon a degree of public understanding that is beyond where it is at the moment, as I, where I, power lies? I think it's fundamental. Uh, I, I was quite surprised uh, in my travels uh, when people were saying to me, uh, you know, you've got to ensure that the health service is uh, a matter for the Scottish Parliament. And I was even surprised myself to find out the health service was devolved in 1948, when I was four, right? Mm -hmm. It was actually devolved then because all the health services were set up independently. Uh, education, I knew from the school days, has been devolved since about 1451. I, we just have a different education system. But the perception out there is that we don't really control our health service, we don't really control education. We think we control this, but maybe we don't. There's a lot of confusion out there. And I have to say, you know, even among people I thought should know these things, I thought, by the way, the 16, 17-year-olds had a better grasp of yeah. some of this. <laughs> but... So to, to, for these things to work, and we're bringing in additional taxation powers here and we're bringing in additional welfare powers, people need to understand what is in the hands of the Scottish Government. And people in, in the UK and, and uh, Westminster need to understand actually what's been devolved. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. And all I'm saying is that I think as well as governments talking together, for goodness sake, let's make sure that people understand what is devolved and, and how it works. Do, do you, do, just finally, Bruce, Bruce. Um, on this, and then I'll let other colleagues in, but do you find that surprising when we, we just had a referendum debate and one of the, one of the comments that's often made is, is how educated our whole, our whole country has become in, in matters political and, and that is seen as a positive thing. And I suppose perhaps people maybe have stronger and, and better articulated views about how they would like the country to be run, but they don't seem to have a great understanding of how it actually is. There's still, there's still a long way to go, mm. but I think what happened this year, uh, and maybe to an extent last year as well, in running up to the referendum has been great. 85% of people actually voting, uh, who could vote, voting and engaged in things. People I know who don't have a political bone in their body were asking questions about how things are run and so on. And these people have not gone away, incidentally. Uh, 
I think that's a good thing for democracy. And, and I think, uh, you know, I would just plea, in case we run out of time here, that the people around this table ensure that the work that we've done over the last 10 weeks is seen through in the current agreement form into uh, legislation and that some of the things that I've pointed to on, you know, it, improving the education, improving the knowledge of people about, about what's happening here is, is, is uh, done as well. So, anyway, I'm sorry, it's a long-winded answer. But. Um, I'm going to go to, I think it was, was it Mark? Mark McDonald, very quickly, and then I'm going to come to yeah. Lewis to deal with some of the issues that you made personal recommendations around Boston. I'll, I'll, I'll be very quick, Convener. You, you've mentioned, Lord Smith, creating this uh, permanence for this institution within law. I just wonder, given that there is no written constitution in the UK and no government by definition can bind its successor, how you envisage that being a reality? The UK law will say that this is permanent. That's our intention. Nothing's permanent. I think since Magna Carta or something, you know, that it, nothing can quite be. And I'm told by constitutional experts down in London and what used to be called Dover House, but it's probably Scotland House now, that you can't actually do it because it's binding future parliaments. But we intend this to be written in such a way that a plague of boils or something will break out if anyone in the future ever decides to prorogue or whatever you call it, the, you know, this parliament. So it will be said in as strong language as possible to be, but you're absolutely right. You, you, there's, nothing is permanent because uh, it can all, you know, future governments, uh, democratically elected, can change those things. But this is going to be as permanent, and it will be described as permanent in UK law, UK law, which of course can be changed. But if you knew a way of making it, tell me, because that, you know, that's the will of the Scottish people. It's called, right. a, constitu <laughs> it's called a written constitution, actually. But ah, but that's, the ne that's the next task. That's, that would probably help that particular <laughs> process. But anyway, we'll not go there. Lewis, can I ask you to... Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, Smith Agreement, as you have described it very uh, well, uh, does create a parliament with even greater responsibilities with a, a broadened range of responsibilities and of expertise required and, and, and government the same. And I'm interested in your recommendations on parliamentary and independent oversight of the Scottish Government with that extension of powers. Could you tell us a little bit about your thinking behind that and, and, and where you feel that the scrutiny that currently exists within the Scottish Parliament would fall short in the situation where these additional powers are uh, made available to the Scottish Government? I think a number of people uh, you know, have said to me that they feel that the... And, and I'm just mouthing what other people have said to me, that the committee system in a Scottish Parliament doesn't work as well as the one in Westminster. I don't quite know why, but there isn't as, as strong scrutiny of what's happening as there is in Westminster. And you've seen some of the Westminster... I'm going before a Westminster committee tomorrow, by the way, so thank you for the opportunity to rehearse. I believe it's a blood sport down there. But uh, it, it, I think and that's one thing. The other thing is, if you have huge powers to increase or reduce taxes and huge powers to do things in, in the welfare area, you actually need the parliament itself to be scrutinising in plenary sessions as well. Uh, you know, people have to... I'm just saying you have to step up to the plate, if you like. Uh, you know, if, if you're accountable now to an electorate for some almost £15 billion worth of taxation and certainly in direct, direct devolved uh, stuff through, through this commission uh, of £6.8 billion uh, as a starting point of, of income tax, you know, M MSPs... Who, who now will be able to decide how many they are and which boundaries and whether 16, 17, you know, all that for a mature, mature parliament. They need to think very carefully about the, the great responsibility, if you like, and part of that is, is the, the committee system and part of it is just simply in you know, the parliament itself operating properly and scrutinising everything that's going through. I very much concur with your reference to maturity of the institution being, being, being critical here. And the convener referred to Donald Dewar at the outset. At that point, it was said because 
uh, the committee system will effectively be a second chamber than a unicameral parliament will do, uh, given the range of powers that were being devolved. Has that changed in your view, uh, given that the committee system hasn't lived up to perhaps expectations in terms of the level of scrutiny? I'm, I'm only reporting what people told me. Sure. I've never actually sat in a committee until, I split, until fairly recently. Um, I, I, wh whether you need a second house, I, I, and I'm, by the way, I'm not looking for a job there. I just want you to know, a house of lairds, or perhaps, or something. Um, I, I, I don't think you, know, you need a, a second chamber at all. I think it just adds another complication to the thing. But I do think you need to, to look at, I have been told, at how the committee system works, how diligent they are, how, how strong they can be in uh, calling a government and indeed other organisations uh, to account. In, in our report, we're expecting a number of UK organisations to have to come before uh, the Scottish Parliament. And again, I would want that scrutiny to be uh, pretty strong as well. So I'm just saying, w with, with, it, with power comes responsibility. That's really what I'm talking about. OK. I, I had another aspect, okay. Premier, if, 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 if nobody's rushing to, to come in, which was one of your other particular ones around devolution from the Scottish Parliament to local communities. And, and you say in, in, in your conclusions that that will require significant further thought. Is that an additional layer, if you like, of improving democracy within Scotland? I, I believe so. Let me tell you, this was a very, very strong voice, and it came through in all sorts of different areas, but particularly in areas like welfare, charitable, and so on. Cities and uh, rural areas were saying to me, look, it's all very well, Holyrood getting extra powers, and we welcome that. But if you take areas of welfare... Uh, particularly around poverty and so on, is, is absolutely the case. Rural poverty is different from inner city poverty. And it is absolutely proven academically that the closer you get to point of need, the better is the welfare provision, because you actually understand what you're dealing with rather than being up here. Now, it, it's in Holyrood, and all I'm saying is lots of people were saying, could you think about devolving power more down to the point of need in a lot of areas. So uh, that's all. It's just a voice in the street. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying whether all five parties bought into that. Uh, it's my views. It's what I was hearing time and time again. And I'm, all I'm saying to Holyrood is, with the additional powers you're getting, and, and even with the existing powers you have, think about you know, how you could devolve some of that to everyone's advantage. Right, last question, Rob Gibson. Make it quick, please. Uh, it is indeed. Scottish Parliament committees cannot compel witnesses like uh, the UK can. Do you think that should change? Ooh. I think that's a matter for uh, democratically elected people like you. But if, if you think, I mean, I know that your presiding officer is looking at the committee system right now, and I would just say more power to our elbow. Uh, if you decide... I'm not here to you know, provide solutions to these things, but if you decide as parliamentarians here, elected by the people, that you should have the ability to you know, force people to come, before, then I think you should look at that. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you very you. much, Paul Smith, for coming along and giving us... I know the time was short this morning, so I'm very grateful for you coming and giving us the time you've had. We could probably spend quite easily two or three hours on this, but we recognise diary pressures, however. Um, what happens next? We get the, the UK government and the Scottish government on Thursday. Um, there'll be, I suspect, the questions will be a bit more searching in, in terms of where, where we go now. I think, certainly round the table, we all recognise the scale of responsibility we've got to make sure that when the legislation eventually flows, um, that we've got quite a job to make sure to make sure it's all practical uh, and recognise that. Uh, and the last piece of advice I would give you, blood sports were actually outlawed, so you can tell them that tomorrow <laughs> if you get out of hand. And uh, can I thank you very much for coming along, you and Jenny, for giving evidence this morning. Very grateful to you. And uh, we will meet on Thursday. Thank you very much.